Um, Kate and Emma, welcome to Be Waste Wise. Can you unmute yourself? There. All right. Awesome. Great. Wonderful. Uh, thanks so much. So, friends, we have um, Kate Berlow from um, Resource Futures and um, Sorry, uh, Emma Berlo from Resource Futures and Kate Bailey from EcoCycle. And um, so uh, the reason um, we have both of them today here is um, Emma and her co-authors have published, a, um, I think, an amazing report um, on eliminating all avoidable plastic waste. And in that, they've uh, put together a categorization of single-use plastics. Um, given the amount of noise around uh, single-use plastics um, today, I thought that was a great methodological approach on how to, you know, how to move forward with that issue. So, um, and then Kate Bailey has been doing amazing work at EcoCycle. I've been following her work and um, on on zero waste, and I thought she would be, you know, the best person to um, have that kind of expertise to understand what's going on both sides of the world and find ways in which we could implement that categorization, the use based, use phase based categorization um, in different communities um, in the US and also in, in Europe. So, um, and this discussion will be led by um, Kate Bailey. So um, Kate, welcome to Be Waste Wise. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Of course, Ranja. Thank you for having me this morning. All right, great. So um, you can um, take it from here. Um, you can um, and then ask Emma to introduce herself and then, you know, you can go ahead with your questions. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start with a quick introduction of myself and EcoCycle and then Emma, I'd love to kick it over to you. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us. I am so proud to be here representing EcoCycle. We are one of the oldest and largest nonprofit recyclers in the US. We are based in Boulder, Colorado, and we started one of the first 20 curbside recycling programs in the country back in 1976. So we have over 40 years of hands-on experience building recycling programs and working with the entire community. Uh, we are a nonprofit, much like WasteWise, uh, our Be Waste Wise. We're also a lot like Eureka Recycling, who many of you hopefully heard from yesterday. Uh, and what makes us different is we are both a recycling business and an advocacy organization. So EcoCycle actually collects, processes, and markets recyclables. We process 50,000 tons per year. So we understand markets and collections and how to move the materials and the logistics of it. And we're also at our core an advocacy and an education group. So we firmly believe that everyone in the community should be involved in moving towards zero waste. So we have programs for residents and businesses. We work with schools. We work with local governments on policy. We have zero waste events. We think everybody has a role to play in moving toward a zero waste future. Um, so. So I come to you with, with a group of people behind me representing all that hands-on experience. Um, and we are thrilled to be here talking with Emma Burlow this morning. Uh, well, this morning for me, I should say. Um, and Emma, I wanted to give you a chance to introduce yourself and then I want to uh, get right into the amazing report. Great, thanks so much, Kate. Likewise, really good to be with you this afternoon for us. So I'm Emma Burlow. I work for Resource Futures. So um, like yourself, Kate, we're a not-for-profit rooting organisation. We're also a B Corp. So I don't know if you've heard of that organisation. Um, we've got a heritage of recycling. So we were set up many years ago. Um, uh, with a couple of recycling partners and then in the last 10 years we've been a consultancy organization so we have a team of about 45 people um, and we cover a, a range of um, consultancy for businesses and local authorities and, and policy makers across the whole spectrum really from from waste composition analysis so actually getting in and an analyzing the waste right through to um, uh, local authority waste services um, and then my specialism which is circular economy we also have a, have, have a community engagement arm um, and communications. Um, so we run programs um, like Community Repaint, which is a, re, a paint redistrib redistribution network in the UK, uh, which is very popular, and um, also some community action groups. 
So quite similar, without the actual physical recycling part, Kate, we've got um, quite a broad range of experience and, and quite a long heritage, sort of um, over 30 years heritage in the business. And, you know, on, on the smaller side, but we do compete with some of the big consultancies in the UK. We do a lot of work for RAP and a lot of work for Zero Waste Scotland and the Welsh Government um, alongside, you know, some household names um, and some tiny businesses, which we love working with. So, um, so the report you mentioned was was part of a piece of policy um, support that we did um, for a partnership of organisations, uh, trying to influence the debate and trying to stimulate, you know, stimulate the discussion, um, which has been going round in circles. <laughs> so, uh, so that's what we're trying to do is sort of cut through, cut through that uh, ever, ever, you know, ever going debate and, and look at things through a different lens. Um, so that, that's kind of who we are at Resource Futures. Great, thank you, Emma. Um, sounds like a wonderful team of people you get to work with. Is, great yeah. So yeah, before we get right into the before we get into the nuts and bolts of the report, I was hoping you could give us a little background on what motivated it. There's been some great discussion we're watching out of the UK mm. um, around circular economy and the plastics pact and. Mm honest we're watching it with a lot of jealousy um we are oh, really? not having that discussion at the federal level here in the u.s um so i was hoping you could give us just a little bit of background mm -hmm. on the the policy directives and sort of the why like why is this coming to fruition why is this a high level topic right now yeah yeah well i have to say um i've been in the business about 22 years so it, it it did come as a bit of a the speed of it has come as a bit of a surprise for everybody um so it's not that we've been planning to get to this position for the last 10 years and we've suddenly got there it's um i think we have to thank blue planet if i'm honest um and i mean that you know without without a hint of of kind of sarcasm i think the public interest particularly in planets in plastics has been massively massively boosted by the media around marine plastics um in particular Okay, so you may think, well, you know, how has that affected things? But that has gone all the way through to sort of high level decision making. And I think what, what was happening was there were a lot of these conversations were being had, but they didn't quite have the stimulus. And I think, as Mitch was saying earlier, it's taken a bit of a crisis for that to happen. Now, the China thing has been there, but it's not really hit the public um perception quite as much that's hit the uh, industry minds and the policy makers but it's not really been the big mover in terms of household names and retailers being put under a lot of pressure now to make a change so in the background organizations like rap and and um you know the welsh government and the scottish government particularly were trying to move towards some of these arguments and i have to say probably following a european model and then along came the pressure from china and um, the marine plastics debate and the, the last 12 months has, has really escalated so the impetus behind that report was really um, to see if we could offer industry a kind of um, a steer in terms of how to start their decision making because although this has been in the debate arena for a while it's not really been acted on so if the industry are going to suddenly start changing types of plastics that they use, where do they start? I think that was the worry. Um, so we were initially commissioned to look at a plastics hierarchy. So in the same way as a resource, you know, a waste hierarchy. Um, but actually through the course of that um, research, we actually um, devised, you know, a different methodology because it became clear that actually the waste hierarchy was useful in, in a very generic sense but it isn't useful when you get down to individual products and polymers um, because, you know, one polymer could be used in a very different way in a, in a, in a disposable item as it would be used in a, in a very durable item. Um, so, um, so yes, w we were asked to, to do that report really to, to provide a bit of decision-making advice for businesses, a bit of a steer. Great. I completely agree that the, uh, the this topic has been bubbling for some time, but yes. the speed at which it's sort of come to a boil and captured yes. at least the global conversation is super exciting. Um, yes. And and I, I think we're both in a position of wanting to support that momentum and let's yeah, take yeah, this yeah, yeah. watershed moment. It. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's really good. Um, it's the best momentum I've seen in, in 20 years. I'm, I, I just have 
say that I think it, it is it is quite political at the moment and it is quite emotive and one of the things we're trying to do is to help businesses make um evidence-based decisions uh, that you know for longer term or from fundamental moves away from single-use plastics so there's a lot of talk at the moment about banning and taxing and that sort of thing that's all been you know the plastic bag tax has, has been around a while now and it's been quite successful but um there's a lot of talk in fact we're doing some work now on the sort of the evidence base for banning things like straws, um, balloon sticks, um, plastic plates, you know, cutlery, that sort of thing. And whilst it's great, it's still only scratching the surface. So I, you know, my hope with this report was that there was something for everybody that was, even if you're working on quite a durable product, that you could still make some change to that product to make it either more recyclable or more durable. Um, and, you know, you can still contribute rather than it just being about beach litter, which is where a lot of the focus um, has been in the in the early stages anyway. I completely agree. We are definitely hearing a lot of that focus on the single use plastics, a lot of movement around straws in particular, mm -hmm. um, which is great. It's a great place to start. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of focus on what I can do as an individual and you know the the personal changes that yeah. that people can make and I and I completely agree like that has a role to play but I love that your report helps elevate the conversation it's not just what we can do as individuals but you lay out a very pragmatic a very um, useful approach I mean you take a large issue plastics is such a large mm -hmm. complex yeah, issue yeah, it was, um, it was and I really, yeah, I really appreciate how you broke it down. So can you talk a little bit more for the people uh, on the call with us about the, yeah. the time frame that you use to break down the plastics and how you broke them into categories? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and I you know, I can't take individual credit for this. There's a couple of great consultants that work in my team that, 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 that you know, came up with this. But we started banding around um, the issue about how plastics um their end of life basically so as you will know um the whole issue with recycling is if you can't capture and collect something you know or if it's contaminated when you do collect it that you know its value is lost uh, and you know its value is lower so you can't get a second market for it um there's also the other issue about about plastic leakage into the environment so we felt that through the normal waste hierarchy these things weren't really captured because it, the waste hierarchy assumes that you will capture something for recycling so we started to look at where things were used and the difference between um, products that we had a very short life that were used for 30 seconds or less, um, right up to products that might have a durability of up to 12 years. So some, you know, plastics used in, in, um, in cars, in airplanes, in buildings, you know, construction is a huge use, user of plastics. So um, we ended up coming up with this um, categorization that fluctuated a bit but we settled on five categories from very short sort of less than a day um, and very small so those tend to be things like straws wet wipes sanitary products that sort of thing all the way up to long life which is up to we said more than 12 years so i mentioned constructions carpets um, some textiles that sort of things uh, even plastics that are used in infrastructure and reinforcements and things um, and when we looked at those, we realized, regardless of the polymer type, um, that the way those products were used would place them in a completely different market and a completely different collection zone place in the world, even from, you know, regardless of the fact that they may both be made out of PET, for example. So, um, so when we started looking at that, it was very clear that the user interface was very, very important. Um, as in what that user did with that item, its functionality, the value that they got from it during its lifetime. And you could almost compare the two. You could almost say, you know, how valuable is that product um, in terms of, you know, the, the energy that's gone into making it versus its function functionality when you use it. And if it's being discarded almost too quick, you know, it's, it, that's you can see where the, where the error in the, the judgment is there. You know, you've got a product that has got, uh, it, uh, you know, a lot more um, resource use gone into it than it ever has been used to stir a cup of coffee or something. And then it, as it moves through, you get these longer life products where you see that actually plastic is exactly the right product for that job. 
you know, particularly around light weighting, um, you know, um, cars and vehicles are a classic example, you know, moving to more and more plastic in vehicles, but they're using less and less fuel because they're lighter. Um, so there was a sort of, we didn't get massively into it in this report, but there was definitely a big um, complicating factor around carbon emissions. So this all sort of got tied up in, in this report. So at the end of the day, we couldn't tackle it all. Like you said, it's very complex. And when you start taking in life cycle um, analysis into, into account, the items with the shortest life cycle, you know, inherently have a, a higher burden. Um, and therefore, that, you know, that, those are the ones that you should need to eliminate or need to look at first. Um, so that, 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 is, you know, that, that, that rings true with the argument about um, single use disposals, um, disposables. But also it gives companies something to work at for those other items that are a bit longer use. So you might have food and drink packaging, for example, which is a very contentious issue at the moment. Um, so a lot of people are um, campaigning for supermarkets to go plastic free and to get rid of plastic packaging. So now that item may be single use in our eyes, but it may actually be in use for anything up to two years. If someone buys a product, say pasta, they put it in the shelf in the cupboard, it stays there for a year, and then they dispose of it. Or longer, they may freeze it, and it be in the freezer for a year, two years, and then they may eat. So, so that piece of plastic has functionally provided quite a long service, although it seems very quick when we throw, you know, take it out and throw it away. Had that product been bought raw on the shelf, a, you couldn't, you know, you, you, you couldn't necessarily keep it for so long and you have the food waste issue. So, so there's a really interesting conundrum in the middle here about these um, short life, but not disposable. So, again, our report looked at that and that includes things like agricultural films as well, cosmetic containers, even things like bags for life, which are potentially single use, but could be in use for a long time. And then how do you get those items back? Again, they're in a completely different use phase area than, than the disposable items. So um, that's the sort of way we looked at it. We took, the, we took literally hundreds of items and categorized them. Um, and they all fell into these five categories of very short use, medium to, to long, long term use. Well, kudos to you and your team for, for taking yeah. such a complex issue and breaking it down. And I, I really do appreciate that you didn't start from the premise that all plastic is bad or needs to be eliminated. I think it's right to acknowledge that plastic has led to a lot of light weighting and automotive. There's medical advances. Like There yeah. are very useful applications and the carbon footprint, the resource footprint are a lot lower because of that. Um, yeah. And I think so I think that's, really that's important. important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to start a little bit with the the single use plastics because I think mm -hmm. that's uh, where everyone's kind of coming around. The uh, you know these ones are the ones that we should focus on first. And my question to you is, you know, you you call out in the report avoidable or unnecessary plastics, which is. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with, um, but I think if I if I was a manufacturer, it might feel like it was a little harsh. Um, and I'm wondering if you're getting any pushback from government. Um, or from yeah, about, it's all, all manner of pushback. Um, well, yes and no. And I mean, I, you know, I was project director for this project, so I was kind of guiding the guys. And and you know, so my consultants would tell it how it is, and then I would sometimes have to sort of say, well, you know, this is probably not going to land that well. But there were a couple of contentious issues in here. Um, you know, there's, there, there was quite a lot of contention around bioplastics, which is a whole separate argument. Um, and also um, there was a bit, you know, you, you, you can spend a long time trying to think, well, shall we call it unavoid? You know, shall we call it avoidable? Shall we call it unnecessary? But I think where we landed was if that product could equally be done by some other, you know, if there was a, if there was a, a, a perfectly suitable alternative, um, then you could... Uh, make the judgment that that was unnecessary, you know. Um, so I think where things are, there wasn't, you know, there isn't an alternative at the moment. Or there are there are items like you say that's very difficult to find a suitable alternative, or the carbon impact must would be ridiculously, you know, higher 
then uh, we need to work harder on those, you know. So I, I, I probably have, I prefer avoidable, if I'm honest, but there are some things which are just crazy, you know, like sticks that you put balloons on. It's hard to argue that those are a necessary part of life. Right. <laughs> so, you know, so I wouldn't say it was, um, there were very many things that were totally unnecessary, but they would probably fall more into the novelty category. Um, you know, we looked at things like balloons and little games and, and things like that, which you could argue uh, you could probably live without or find an alternative. <laughs> I agree. Um, so you mentioned bioplastics is, of course, a huge issue. Um, and so we run a lot of zero waste events with a lot of recycling and composting. And, and so we see we see a lot of businesses, a lot of events just say, great, we'll just swap out plastic straws for compostable straws yeah. or uh, plastic plates for compostable plates. And, um, you know, from the waste hierarchy, from, from the idea of reducing material use, uh, they may be compostable, they're still disposable. There's just still a single use uh, product and that composting infrastructure is largely not in place in the US. And I think the UK is also is developing it as well. So I wanted to yeah. see if you could talk a little bit about some of the complications with bioplastics and, and where they might play a role and, and where that's maybe not the right path. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's an emerging industry. I mean, so, you know, bioplastics is still only 1% of, of global plastics. So um, I hope it grows. You know, I definitely think there's a place for it. Um, I think it's just one of these things that when you scratch the surface, you it's never quite as simple as it seems. Um, so a couple of problems, I suppose. One is, like you say, the infrastructure isn't quite isn't there yet, um, and that's, and this goes for all sorts of things. I mean, in food waste in the UK, we have we put in these um, biodegradable food bags. You know, these plastic bags that are biodegradable, um, but we have various kind of um, not not anecdotal, but I mean, you know, consultants have been on visits to anaerobic digestion plants where the operators say we, you know, we don't want these bags. They just clog up the machines. We have to rip them out. The residence times for those compost um, facilities are too short for the for the bags. So the same would be true of of some of the compostable bioplastics. So until a um, either um, either those compost uh, operators. <clears throat> need to be incentivized in some way to extend the residence time because obviously they want to make compost as quick as possible they don't want to be waiting 12 weeks for a cup to biodegrade or they need to be a special plant and i understand that those you know they do exist but they're certainly not commonplace so the issue you've then got is contamination with uh, traditional plastic feedstock so you actually you know you risk cross-contamination of the two of the two uh, feedstocks if those cups then or bottles for example probably a better example um, then go into you know plastic recycling, which we've just had uh, you know we've just heard from from the previous speakers about um, the dangers of kind of communication and, and how people recycle. So particularly with products that are on the go, I think it's quite dangerous because most people will just dump dump those products in an A bin and then that becomes mixed recycling. Chances are it's either going to be a contaminated load or it's going to end up in landfill or incineration because once that load's contaminated, it, it's not worth sorting. And, you know, how do you tell a, a bioplastic bottle from a, a non-bioplastic bottle until we've got that infrastructure? Um, the other thing I would say, and it's true of normal uh, of fossil plastics as well, is there's a lot of additives based, you know, in plastics, in lots and lots of different types of plastics. So the problem is even more complicated than just fossil versus bio. You know, there are a lot of plastics that um, have, have additives in for whatever reason. Again, very innovative and perform lots of wonderful functions, but give us a headache um, at the other end. Um, I've got some personal fears about, bio, about bioplastics as well, in that I think if we were to convert overnight, you know, which we won't, that we may, we may have a similar issue as we've had with, with things like palm oil and sugarcane and, you know, growing biofuels uh, where in countries where people ought to be buying, you know, growing fuel, uh, food for themselves, those sorts of things. So fuel, food stock, uh, plastic bio stock is an issue that I don't know enough about, but, um, you know, it's something I, I, would, I would want to, to know more about. 
So I completely agree that that plastics are a headache um, for recycling. Yeah. I can say that you know for processing them for over thirty years, the the complexity of the additives, the different polymers, the shapes, the sizes. Um, plastics recycling has always been a headache, and uh, we're we're finding ourselves in an interesting position as a recycling organization. You know, we we've, we've been in recycling for forty years. Um, it is our heart and soul. We fundamentally believe it is the, the foundation of a circular economy, right? We can't we can't get there without getting these materials back into the loop. Um, but there's a lot of discussion right now in the U.S. We've been uh, heavily impacted as an industry on the restrictions China has put around mm -hmm. accepting plastics, in particular for recycling. And a lot of people are uh, calling on recycling as broken. Or, or taking the opportunity to say, you know, the system isn't working. And, and so we're finding ourselves in an interesting position as, as a nonprofit, as an advocacy group of saying, to some extent, yes, recycling is not going to fix this problem, right? We are not simply going to recycle our way out of this plastics problem. And trying to unite the industry to say, let's stand up and say, this mm -hmm. isn't our fault. Right? We were never going to be the ones to solve the problem, and we need more help. Um, so I would say we're taking um, two approaches. One is a little different than, so your report focuses a lot on the timeline of how materials are used. Um, we are seeing a lot of attention, particularly on types of plastics. So a lot of communities are having trouble marketing what are called three through seven plastics. Um, okay. So the, the number one PET bottles, the number two HDPE yeah. milk jugs, those have solid markets. They always have. They're pretty easily recyclable. Um, we can debate how much we should be using bottled water and all that stuff, but um, those markets are solid. What we're seeing instead is these, the number three plastics in particular, the number six, the polystyrene, styrene plastics, mm -hmm. and the number yeah. seven, which is kind of that catch-all. Um, so one of the approaches we're seeing here in the U.S. And, and a little bit around the world is calling on some of those polymers to be phased out. Like, yep. when can we replace a number six with a number five that's more mm -hmm. recyclable? And, mm -hmm. and when can that number three be a number two? Um, and really trying to, uh, I want to say, pick the lesser of the evils, right? If we're going to make <laughs> yeah, yeah, some plastic. Way. Let's make the ones that are less bad and more recyclable. And do you think that sort of product substitution or polymer yeah, substitution plays a role? Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. So so the report does focus on the timeline, but the recommendations for each of those groups, if you like, then focus on you know what to do. So it's a sort of there's a decision making tree process. So if you can't do this, then do that. So if you can't replace with a reusable alternative, then replace with biodegradable. You know, so we do talk about where bioplastics would be helpful, and that's where um, the very short use phase, where those products have got the highest potential for leaking into the environment. So you know, on a cafe, on a beach, you know, those sorts of items. There's an argument that there's a chance that that's going to end up in the ocean. We just have to accept that. We've done everything we can. Um, if you can't, you know, if you can't close your your if you can't close your system 100%, then go for biodegradable because at least if it escapes then it, it you know it under the right conditions it will biodegrade so you go through the reusable and then you go for those longer term products where you can say okay we can design this for higher recyclability and that's exactly what you were talking about so that is one of our options so there is a hierarchy that's come out of this so it's the obvious kind of eliminate reuse and recycle but the recycle is kind of expanded to say, OK, let's not just say it's recyclable anymore. Let's let's choose a polymer that's more recyclable or easier to recycle um, than than other things. Or let's take the label off or let's make the cap, you know, the same material or uh, let's make it modular. So you only have to throw away one bit at a time. So there's all those classic kind of circular economy principles that come out of this. But it's really about being able to pinpoint where you are in that chain. And not try and say, oh, do we treat, you know, um, uh, I don't know, a car part that because it's made of PET the same as a plastic bottle because it's made of PET. You know, we, we can't treat those things the same. 
I completely agree. And I, and I like in what you're saying that we're talking about manufacturers being more proactive in their design, right? They're the ones who can make the decision about what polymers are used, what additives are used, what choices they make. Recycling has always been reactive, right? We're always trying to figure out yeah, what do we do with this thing that got thrown at us. Yeah. Mm. Um, so I, I like in the report that for some of the more durable materials in particular, there's a stronger call on producers to not only make the right material choices, but also to invest more in recycling markets and to be buying those materials back, to be creating that demand for those products because you know, that's a lot of what we're seeing right now is is a slump in markets, is that that companies are not stepping up to say, you know, we want more of that PET, we mm -hmm. want more of that polypropylene, and we, and we need somewhere to sell those materials, especially now that China's not buying it anymore. Yeah, yeah, you need to drive the demand without that. We're, you know, we're nowhere really. We, 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 can, we can collect and sort as much as you like, but until that, that demand is there. And I do think that's the next phase. We, you touched on the plastics pact, and that's the thing. And I think the ch real challenge is going to be driving those markets. I think a lot of um, particularly retailers are, uh, uh, you know, they're under pressure now to make some changes and I think they will. But the kind of cynic in me thinks they can make those changes, uh, uh, you know, as much as they like, but can we actually do anything with the, the new product? You know, is it going to be, because they don't, you know, they, they don't fully understand the recycling sector in the, in the marketing department, you know, so why would they? So it's a bit like this switch to bioplastics. Sometimes there's a few knee jerk things going on where people go, oh, we'll solve that, we'll solve that, but haven't really solved it by switching to bioplastics, for example. So you're going to have the same issue with the polymer choices. You're going to need quite a lot of, um, you know, that's quite a technical sphere um, for, for, for product developers to get their head around. Um, so that's going to take a little bit longer, I think, than the, than the kind of quick fixes. But you're absolutely right. We need better labeling, you know, things like taking PVC windows out of buildings. What do you do with them? Where's the secondary markets? There's an enormous amount of work to do. Um, and almost every sector needs to look at that, you know, individually as a sector and say, you know, what are our key raw materials and what, and what do we do with them and how do we get them back? And that's somewhere where I hope we can see some collaboration uh, across the ocean between the UK and the US. We have so many of the same manufacturers. So of course. Um, yeah. we're very jealous that you have great policy driving driving those innovations. And we hope to capitalize off of that. You know, that they're making the same products over there for the same markets as over here. So how can we how can mm. we build off those successes and, and standardize our systems and um, so as we're kind of getting near the end of our discussion, I wanted to encourage people, of course, uh, chat in your questions uh, for Emma or for myself. We'd be happy to, to take questions from folks. Uh, Emma, one of the questions I wanted to wrap up with you, I think it's always a fun question to ask. Um, if you had a magic wand and you could wave it and make some recommendation from the report happen, what would it be? What do you think is the most important or the, or the kind of first one you'd like to see happen? Wow. I think I'd like to see, um, you know, I think, I think we do need to follow through with some of these eliminate issues. I think there needs to be some strong uh, message um, because as far as I can see, um, and this is sort of a bug bear that I've had for lots of years, and you know, there's, a, there's a kind of retailer extra, uh, versus consumer argument going on. So uh, you know, retail marketeers and retailers, and I work with a lot of them, and, and you know, they're great. They're very fast thinking people, and they develop products, you know, in their sleep. And they always say, "This is this is what the consumer wants. This is consumer driven. They've told us they want this stuff." Okay, and then I'm like, "I'm a consumer. I've I don't want these packages. I can't even open and then have to throw away. You know, I've never asked for that. You know, the same as I never asked for ten versions of an iPhone. You know, so I never asked for those things. So there's a new conundrum here." And I think a lot of these products that we're talking about have been designed and built for a function because someone thought it was a great idea. And it's almost like that's crazy enough. Someone will buy it, you know, like a balloon on a stick, you know, those things. And it's just a point I would love to see that someone is brave enough to say, do you know what? We don't need that stuff. You know, we're doing fine as we are. <laughs> it's just this whole and I know it's a consumerism thing. It's like, what is the next piece of tat? that you need to make out of a bit of plastic. It's almost like 
a, a, a challenge to invent the next, you know. So I wish, if I could wave a magic wand, that that kind of need to keep inventing useless little bits of plastic could stop. And for people to just say, what happens to this once I've sold it? You know, it is my responsibility as you give food to a child, you know, what is going to happen afterwards? And, and that's my, you know, my wish is that marketeers say, actually, I'm great at my job and I can design really good things. And actually, I'm responsible too. You know, um, so if they could get over that hump of once it's on the shelf, it's no longer my problem. You know, I, I hope the images of beach plastic and that sort of thing are starting to do that. But I don't know if that's pulling right back through. It's obviously working for some products, but it's not pulling right back through to those products that are disposed of in the home. That still go in a black sack. So I'm, a, you know, I'm a great one for out of sight, out of mind. As soon as the person who invented the black sack has blown it for lots of us, really, because as soon as it's in there, you can't see it anymore. <laughs> Whilst it's lying on a beach, you can, you know. So magic wand is marketeers out there, you know, think past the shelf, and 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 really, your responsibility ends when that product is on its way back to you, being made into the next thing. You know, that's what I would like to see. Right, and that really embeds circular economy thinking yeah. right into the design stage. Is, is yeah. I'd like to tell people that designers should also be thinking not just what happens to my product, but how do I get it back? How do I how do I get it back to make my new products again? And and yeah. why would I want it back? And how what does that system look like? And you know, especially with um, not so much single use things, but with um, packaging or or uh, electronics or things that are multi-part, you know, I'm going to be buying those products back as the manufacturer to be making my new products. That's how the loop um, is going to work. So um, I think that that's great. I do think that as a recycler, um, we do have some packaging companies that do reach out to us. They come tour our facility. Um, oh, and so there are some leaders in the industry who I think are looking at. Oh, definitely. Uh, yeah, they're looking both at their responsibility and they're also looking at the business opportunity, right? At yeah. the end of the day, how can they get an edge by making a product that is responsible and that is uh, well designed and that people want because they feel good about it? So, yeah. Um, yeah, there, certainly, there certainly is at the, at the sort of uh, the, the middle to top end of the market. I think, you know, we need to get into the mainstream and, the con, you know, the, the convenience market. And anyone knows if you go out for the day, it's really hard to avoid disposable packaging. You know, so we need to get into the, to the minds of the really quick consumer takeaway on the go. Those markets are the ones that um, if we can prove that we can do it there, then I think. The, co the, the, the consumer will engage further up the chain on these kind of more durable products, which ultimately is where we need to end up. And there's more value in them anyway, and it's worth remanufacturing them more. So um, it's hard to expect people to remanufacture crisp packets, you know, but it's when you get up to, to a bit more um, products with a bit more value in them, those are things that, that, that people should be looking to, to get value back from. Absolutely. And so Sarah has asked a good question about uh, man manufacturers that you, she's heard that manufacturers have issues using recycled materials because of the quality um, and the contamination. And I, I think our last set of speakers spoke uh, a lot about contamination and the need for better education. I will say that from a recycler perspective, uh, and as a nonprofit in particular, EcoCycle has invested a lot of time and energy in education and engaging the community and good signage and, and collection systems. And what we're seeing is our materials have much lower contamination coming in uh, and much lower contamination going out. And because of that, we're able to get higher prices for them, which helps justify that spending on education. Um, and so we build stronger markets. So I think, you know, that that is definitely a concern. Manufacturers want clean materials. That's a lot of what we're seeing in China where they're like, this is dirty stuff. We can't take it anymore. Um, but there are recycling models out there that are working, that are heavily invested in education, creating valuable materials that industry wants to buy back. And so I think at least here in the U.S., the, the China restrictions have a little bit of been a wake-up call, a needed wake-up call, 
um, to focus more on education and reducing contamination, kind of clean our act up a little bit. Um, so I, we have another question from Hayden uh, asking about wish cycling. So wish cycling <laughs> is definitely it's a, a new big one thing. I like that term. Yeah. Do you guys have experienced that as well? Yeah. Well, I think it's I think it's linked to the previous question actually. Um, I think to to reduce contamination. I mean, uh, uh, the ideal way to to reduce contamination obviously is to have a closed loop system. So you know manufacturers can go a long long way i mean we are nowhere you know we're just scratching the surface in terms of closing loops so if you have a product and you can get your own product back if you can lease that product and get you know 99 or 100 percent of that product back talking about bigger items obviously there's no reason why you have contaminated um you know uh, feedstock post-consumer waste i understand is that you know is a whole different ball game but you're normally down cycling that plastic into into other products anyway um, or you might be taking out the HDPE, which you know is relatively clean when you when you can segregate it. Um, so the, the question from Hayden is, you might do this uh, practice of wish cycling. You kind of hope, and this happens a lot in the UK. You can hope that, that this can be recycled, so you put it in the bin, right? So we can't recycle black food trays in the UK, or not not everywhere anyway. And so a lot of people put them in because they go, oh, that's plastic, and it came from the same supermarket, so it must be okay. Um, so. I absolutely think this comes down to elimination and you you've got to give the consumer a hope that you know by putting a load of stuff in there in their in their in their shopping basket that there's no hope of them ever recycling there's no market for you're just setting everyone up to fail really so i think coming back to your point kate you need to be really firm about eliminating some of these plastics that that could be replaced with something else okay it's going to be a penny dearer or whatever but safety aside it could be recycled and if it's not then it needs to be labeled huge big letters you know this cannot be recycled then the consumer's got a choice not to buy it or to put it in the landfill or whatever so yeah i think the responsibility there is you know is a big one on 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 the retailers there absolutely i think you you hit the nail on the head it's it's a lot on the retailers to help consumers understand what to do with their product and really make it clear where does this go um, so I want to wrap up. I want to thank Emma so much for her time. This has been a delightful conversation. Yeah, um, it's great. I will uh, shamelessly pitch ecocycle.org is our website to find out more information about ecocycle and our work to build zero waste communities around the world. So check us out and feel free to reach out to me with questions. Emma, can you uh, close us out with a few thoughts and also uh, tell people how they can access your great yeah. report. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so yeah, likewise, um, follow me on Twitter, Emma Berlo, or, or check out um, Resource Futures website. Um, it's actually undergoing change, so maybe check it out in a couple of weeks. <laughs> uh, you can link to me through LinkedIn as well. I'm happy to send anyone the report. Um, that's probably the best way to do it. I th on, I, I'll, I'll see if I can get it uploaded onto the website. But if not, if individuals either follow me on LinkedIn or, or Twitter, I'll make sure they can get the report. And I always to say thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Ranjith, for having us both on. It's a delightful webinar series, and we're very happy to be part of it. Really enjoyed it. Thanks. All right, awesome, great. Thanks so much, um, Kate, for um, that awesome conversation with uh, Emma. And um, so uh, th this is the very core of our mission, which is um, to connect people who have solutions with those who are looking for solutions. And you know, uh, we started with just um, eight events in 2013, our first year, when we had Daniela Russo participate um, in one of our first events. And we have her again uh, participating um, today um, in the next session. Um, she is the um, CEO of uh, Think Beyond Plastic. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, we started with eight events in 2013, and now uh, this year we did about um, 35 events this year, which is about um, one and a half weeks. And uh, next um, year we're trying to get closer to uh, one event every week, which is the largest. Um, platforms for knowledge dissemination via video. Um, and um, we're looking for regional partners um, who have uh, knowledge and expertise and who are looking for uh, ways to get that knowledge out there. 
um, to a larger audience. Um, so if you are one of them, you know, get in, get in touch with us. We are a nonprofit. Let's work together and let's invest um, our, in our collective future. So thanks, guys. Um, thanks for um, joining thanks. us today. And uh, with that, I'll hide you from the broadcast and I'll bring um, Daniela on. Bye. Bye, Kate. Bye, Randit. Bye.